Passion Harvest. <laughs> Hello, passionate listeners and watchers. Welcome to Passion Harvest. I am Louisa, your host, International Passion Ambassador. Thank you so much for joining us wherever you are in the world right now. I'm so excited about my guest today, Elaine Friend. And if you don't know who she is, Elaine specializes in working with highly sensitive people. Elaine is a licensed marriage and family therapist and international consultant on high sensitivity and has pioneered a form of equine assisted therapy to help highly sensitive teenagers better appreciate their own traits. Elaine works with rescue horses, highly sensitive beings in their own right to help children and adults recognize and better understand sensitivity as well as their own strengths and challenges in social situations. Elaine talks about optimal levels of stimulation and she believes that prevention for anxiety is the key. Overstimulation can look like anxiety and HSP can be misdiagnosed with anxiety and depression. Elaine leads workshops and retreats across the globe. She has developed and implemented programs for highly sensitive people, children, families, and clinicians who serve them. Elaine holds a master's degree in clinical psychology and school counseling, and she hosts the twice monthly Are You Highly Sensitive Live with a Q&A. This is her story, and this is her passion. Elaine, friend, welcome to Passion Harvest. Thank you so much. I'm so pleased to be here. It is my passion. You're right. <laughs> and I'm so excited we finally got together and you're on the show. I think, I mean, there's many of us that are highly sensitive. So if you don't mind by starting, how do we define a highly sensitive person or HSP for short? Right. Um, I'm happy to start there, you know, because I think a lot of people who have the trait of high sensitivity don't even know they have it. Mm -hmm. Um, if we had good enough parenting and schooling, we, we learn to design a life that's compatible with our unique being, and then it's not an issue at all. But if we didn't, then you might be aware, and you might have, like me, grown up being heard, you're just too sensitive, you know, toughen up, the world's going to eat you alive if you're that sensitive. So there are all those ways to recognize, you know, me at the end of a hard day, I'm just debilitated into tears mm -hmm. or me when I've been doing way too much, I'm spinning off into anxiety. Those are ways to recognize my sensitivity when I'm not doing well. But the basic definition, we use an acronym called DOES or DOES and D stands for deep processing. So these are folks whose brains are just more reactive. There's actually functional MRI study research that shows the brain being more active in certain parts um, when doing certain tasks. And so thinking, 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 processing deeply, thinking deeply, it's just hard to turn it off. Um, o is what you were talking about, that overstimulation or over arousal. If you're thinking so much and having the E, which is strong emotional response to all the things you're seeing and thinking, then you're likely to become overwhelmed or over aroused or overstimulated. E is not just emotional responsivity, but also empathy. We actually are stronger in our positive emotional reactions to the world than we are in our negative ones. It's just the negative ones look a little less easy to deal with in the world. And S in DOES is sensitivity to subtle stimuli. That's noticing the subtleties in the world. I often say to parents, the way you can recognize S in your child is they're the child who notices that you got your hair trimmed and they only took off half an inch or you got highlights or you got a new shirt. You know, most young children don't care or notice, but the sensitive child often does. I also say for me, S is I notice when I go into a room, if the temperature's not right or the seating arrangement isn't right or the blinds should be shifted so the sun's not in someone's eyes. I just know right away because I'm always noticing the little things. So that's our best way to identify sensitive people is DOES. Oh my gosh. That, and that's kind of the test, but it sounds exactly like me. <laughs> um, <laughs> I'm probably using the right terminology, but how do we navigate being highly sensitive through this modern day world that we're living in? You know, I, you said a little bit in my bio that I really do believe that the way that we navigate it is through preventing becoming overwhelmed or overstimulated. And, um, you know, I, I like to talk about the highly sensitive person's five to thrive. It's one mm -hmm. of my favorite teaching tools. 
And one of the five to thrive, we can unpack all of them, but one of them is to design a life that's compatible with your trait. So if you know that you need time alone during every single day, you need quiet time every single day, maybe you need exercise, time in nature, a nap, a bath, body work every week, whatever it is that makes you your best self. I can't define what that is for each person. I just listed some things that might apply to me, mm -hmm. <laughs> but we have to design a life that isn't too jam-packed full. One thing that I've learned, and um, it's so hard for me, uh, I'm just going to tell you right now, is I really have to turn the screens off two hours before I want to be asleep. And I can just get lost in my work or my email or something like that in the evening. And if the computer's still on at 10 p.m., I won't be asleep before midnight. And so, and I know, you know how we, how we reset our brains, right? getting a good night's sleep. Okay. And so many of us aren't in this day and age. So designing a life that's compatible with your, your nervous system, what you need, that's how you navigate the modern world. And it wasn't hard in an older world, in previous generations. Why, why are we just kind of thinking and talking about this in the last 25 years? Because all of a sudden the world is not compatible with being more finely tuned, right? And the, the way I grew up on a farm in Oklahoma in the US, and you know, I, my rule was be home by dark and don't go barefoot around the horses. And that was pretty much it. So I was just sort of a wild child out in nature and it was really compatible with my sensitivity. That's beautiful. And I guess the other thing is being okay with your sensitivity. It doesn't matter if you're potentially a bit peculiar or strange. This is what you need to navigate through the world. Well, when you think about it, it's, they found it in 20%, the researchers found it in 20% of over a hundred species. We think it's probably in every species. 20% is a pretty large section mm. of humanity. It's not a small enough number that it could be a, a small enough percentage that it could be a disorder or um, an illness or something like that. It's just the way people are. One fifth, that's tons of people. Now, in where you live and where I live, our cultures might not be so embracing of that 20%. And it might seem like a lot smaller number. But you know why? Most people are sort of in the closet about it. You know, we, we don't, most of us don't go around wagging our, waving our uh, sensitivity flag in the world, you know? And so we try to buck up and act normal and be normal and not be bothered. And so, probably there are people in your workplace and your family, if you're highly sensitive, who are also highly sensitive, mm -hmm. you might not even know it because they're just tucking it in. And because we we're in cultures where, you know, it's maybe a little more value to have your sword out in front and being a warrior than to be going deeply into the inner life and being a sensitive advisor and philosopher, or maybe a spiritual leader. Yes, that's true. It's not as, as, as certainly as well recognized or well recognized and or accepted either. Um, so what is, uh, you talk about a, a highly sensitive extrovert. What's, what's the difference with that? Oh, you know, sensitive extroverts and sensitive introverts. And um, I think most people would think of a highly sensitive person as pretty introverted. That's me. I'm very introverted. Me um, too. <laughs> But here we are extroverting on screen. I know. <laughs> it's that Pushing passion. the boundaries. <laughs> yeah. And, and that passion to help the world, you know, and that's something that we often find is true of highly sensitive people. So it's fascinating. The research shows that 30% of highly sensitive people are actually extroverted wow. and they, they have a harder time in some situations. They have an easier time, right? Cause they can go out in the world, but if you're an introvert, you're more likely to spend more time alone or time at home replenishing and, and resting. And the extras, I'm married to a sensitive extrovert. And it's so hard because the pull to be out in the world doing things causes the extrovert to become really overtired. But I have to just say there is research now on extroverts, whether they're sensitive or not, across the board, they're less likely to take good care of themselves. And they're more likely to get burned out and, and overtired from their all that stimulation, all that social interaction. So they, they are challenged in that regard. You know, sometimes I wish I was an extrovert, 
because you know i'm always the first one who wants to leave any social event <laughs> and you know it'd be nice just to want to be there and um you know but at the same time i go home early and take care of myself i wake up the next morning i'm in great shape so it's so funny you say that because I'm very, I realize now I'm very similar to you, but it's almost viewed as a bad thing as not socially acceptable. And right. it's almost as if we shy away from even saying that. Um, I, how does an introvert and an extrovert balance one another? Well, I value the extroverts in my life because they can be I just put a video on Instagram actually of um, two of my horses. One's oh, an extrovert, wow. one's an introvert. And um, I didn't use that language, but now that we're talking about it, I, I may have to go add onto the comments. Okay. Um, so come find me on Instagram, Elaine Friend, yes. LMFD. And all your details, all your links will be in the show notes for anyone right. to connect with you as well. So um, I actually I put on IGTV, but I think it you know puts a little teaser on Instagram. It does. Yeah. So I. Um, I think it's so nice to have the extrovert pull us out and push us a little bit to be more out. And it's so nice that the introverts pull the extroverts in and model for them. And, you know, we talk in highly sensitive people, introvert or extrovert, that we are practicing this kind of leadership that we call emotional leadership. And, you know, having that, whenever you see someone who is saying, ah, this is too much, Maybe it's the person who smells the smoke from the fires and has a strong reaction. I know Australia's had a lot of fires and Californians had a lot of fires. And, you know, we see that that first person who puts the mask on because the smoke is too much or um, the person who is um, emoting more, crying more at when there's a loss or feeling more overwhelmed. We're showing the rest of the world what an appropriate response is and what they may be feeling some of. And we sort of give permission for the rest of the world to have that, the stronger emotional response. I think introverts and extroverts do that for each other as well. Yes. And you, if you can have that careful, delicate balance between the two, I'm sure it's, I'm sure it's wonderful. Are, are we born, uh, are we born highly sensitive or is it something that you're we getting, learn? You're getting into a really big topic with that oh. question. I'm, I'm, I'm trying so to make great. it easy. Okay. No, I'm really, really grateful because um, yes, it is an innate trait that we are born with. It can't be changed. So how do you know the difference between say ADHD, attention deficit and hyperactivity disorder and HSP? ADHD is, they're both a, a kind of neurodiversity, but ADHD is really a, a, di a mental health diagnosis and um, another way the brain works. And they're actually generally exclusionary of each other. But one thing that you can tell is ADHD does not start in infancy. Generally, it's not seen until the child starts interacting in the world. But in the temperament research and the study, the research on the trait of high sensitivity, and just by the way, the scientific name for this trait is called sensory processing sensitivity. And, um, you know, it's, kind of a complicated name because there is a disorder called sensory processing disorder. And those are children who, um, who can't really control the reactions to sensory input. There's many different ways to have SPD, but um, it's different than sensory processing sensitivity. The names just are similar. So we're born with it. It's, you can see it in an infant. These might be infants that are slow to warm up or um, more reactionary, have stronger, um, more quick to go to feeling too much light, too much cold, too much hunger, the diaper bothers them more. I think most people probably have experienced babies who, you know, they can just sort of sit in the middle of the living room while the party's going on around mm -hmm. them and hardly budge right. and hardly make a peep. And then you have children like my son was who are scampering here and there. That's high activity, not sensitivity, but they're reacting to everything. You know, he was effortless to potty train because one day I said, um, would you rather have the wet diaper or use the potty? And he's like, the wet diaper really bothered him. He said, I want to use the potty. And that was it. Yeah. There was never another mistake, you know? So, um, so you, sensitivity exists and it runs in families too. You might think that's partly why 
if you look at more um, ancient civilizations, maybe even some civilizations still around that you might see shamans or monks or spiritual leaders all being in similar family lines, you know, even if it's not the, the child of it might be the grandchild of, mm-hmm. but it is a genetic um, predisposition. Very interesting. Oh, oh my gosh, I've got lots of questions for you. I have to ask, um, I was just thinking, it just came to mind geographical locations. Some people, and certainly highly sensitive people, would not d- do well in a big city surrounded by people. Um, others would do much well in a quiet country setting. Is that often the case? I mean, for me, that's certainly the case. But what we find is that people who, say, live in huge cities who are highly sensitive, they learn to adapt. Right. And there are some people who actually do better with more sort of ambient noise. You know, if you grew up in, say, New York City or what is your biggest city, Sydney or Melbourne? Yes. 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 And, and you lived in an apartment building, you know, where there's lots of traffic and you heard that noise all the time, then the quiet of the country can feel deeply overstimulating. Mm. It can really be problematic. So we adapt. We're just profoundly resilient and adaptable creatures. And um, we adapt with whatever temperaments or traits we have. Now, my question is digressing here a little bit, but I have to ask you because people talk about it all the time. What about an empath? Is that, a, is that similar? Okay. So I said that the E is strong empathy. Mm-hmm. And we do literally um, have a stronger brain reaction with regard to empathy. That's the place where it's strongest. We, our mirror neurons are very active. Now, empathy and empath are not quite the same. They're related, right? Mm-hmm. And so for now, the research, there's no real scientific research that's validated in the, you know, the scientific community on empaths. It's coming. Until it comes, we can't say, yes, there is a correlation, you know, and I'm kind of representing the scientific view. Many, many um, highly sensitive people, uh, I always say this, I'm going to give you the horses as an example. Okay. People often ask me, the horses are unbelievably tuned in. It's like they read your mind. It's, you can't, you know, anyone who's spent a lot of time with horses will know this or um, spent, especially spent time with horses who are not necessarily in a traditional world, but are in more of a um, free, a pasture or wild horses. Um, they, people are always asking me, are they psychic? Are the horses psychic? And I say, I don't know. I'm not sure it matters. They notice the subtleties so well. They pay such close attention. It's their survival mechanism to pay attention to their environment you know, a fly lands on, they have really thick skin and really thick hair, but if a fly lands on them, they twitch and and get rid of it, or they flick their tail on it. They are so aware of the most minute things. In fact, if you had a band of wild horses spread out over say a quarter mile, if one horse in the herd senses danger and raises their head, every horse in the herd raises their head. Is that psychic? How could they possibly know? We don't know. Are they sensing subtlety so minutely that, that they know when it's happening, that they seem to move as one, the entire herd, or are, or are they empaths? So I'm going to leave it with that around highly sensitive people. We, we seem, we seem like we can read everybody's minds and read the feelings of everybody in the room because we're noticing so much. Where does the line happen where, where someone is an empath or not? Mm -hmm. I don't know the answer and there isn't any research in correlation, but you would think, I would think that most empaths in the world are highly sensitive because their brains are really reactive. So that takes me on. I'd love to hear more about your equine assisted therapy. Uh, I've been doing it for about 19 years and, um, you know, I was a therapist and a horsewoman. And one day a friend said to me, Hey, have you ever heard of equine assisted psychotherapy? I said, only in my fantasies, you mean I could put my profession and my passion together? That's just, nobody should be that blessed. I love that. Yeah. Oh, it's just, it's unbelievable. I, you know, I, I pull up to the barn and it's in a really beautiful Douglas fir and Laurel Bay forest. 
And um, all my horses are rescue horses that I've rehabilitated and trained to do the work. Um, we don't do any riding and um, the horses are usually at liberty, which means free. And that way they can give their most authentic responses to the clients. I've learned so much from that. Um, a friend of mine started calling them my equine colleagues and um, truly they are. And, you know, when I do therapy or consultation, I charge the same, whether I'm on the phone or on the video or in person or with the horses, but obviously the horses cost a lot of money. Right. And, um, and people say, really, it's not more for the horses. And I say, Oh, Oh no, because they're doing most of the work and I'm having such a good time. <laughs> so you, you mentioned about the, the, the horses are wonderful, but how do they work with highly sensitive people? Okay, so we already kind of addressed this issue that it seems like most highly, many highly sensitive people who are struggling or who have found this term before they saw our show here, our interview, um, have felt like sensitivity was a liability in their life. And on um, one of my websites, I, I call it your superpower. And not everyone who's a colleague of mine in the International Consultants for High Sensitivity is into that idea. But I think it's, it's not that we're better, it's that we can leverage our sensitivity into being a superpower and a total asset. And we learn that from the horses because as prey animals, their sensitivity is just who they are. It is their survival, there's no judgment. The more sensitive you are, as a horse, the more likely you are to survive in the wild. The more sensitive you are as a horse, the less likely you are to be a great riding horse in human society. But in the wild, it is just absolutely the sensitive horses that, well, maybe in every species, it's the sensitive members of the species that keep us alive. And um, the other thing about the horses is, I think this is true of many animals. They're always where their feet are. They are so present, so mindful, and there's no better teaching than just to be in the present moment, be aware of your environment and not be ruminating or prevaricating or just perseverating. <laughs> we can use all of our uh, SAT words here, but it's amazing that they are just who they are in the moment. And um, when we sensitive people can be that, then, um, we accept ourselves so much more. And I, and I think that acceptance is really the key to feeling good about ourselves. And, but you can't get there. Oh, here's a chance for another one of the highly sensitive persons five to thrive. You're, First, you're, you're directing the interview. I was about to ask you about that next. So thank you. <laughs> <laughs> and by the way, I just love that analogy with the horses. That was so beautiful. Yeah, Sorry, please you. go on. I, I mean, I, I tell all my clients, you know, they're just here for an hour and I wish you could just spend all day here, just soaking it up and becoming a horse and you would be the, your best self ever. Um, but I was just, awareness is the first A and it's the first of the HSP five to thrive that we really have to know that we have the trait, understand the trait, believe it's real. Um, you know, that you're not just histrionic or whatever it is, whatever insults have been hurled at you for your sensitivity through your life. And most of us have had such things said to us by whomever. I, this is my favorite response to someone who's, who's insulting one's sensitivity. What exactly about my sensitivity is troublesome for you? So if we are aware of the trait, we believe it's real, we understand it, we know it, it describes us then we can start to accept that that's who, how our lives are and that that's who we are. And we truly were designed by the universe or whatever your, your spiritual or religious beliefs are. We were designed to fill a certain need in humanity, in the universe. And in this world, we're maybe not as able to do it. You know, where do you find highly sensitive people? Probably in universities and in religious institutions. Do you know, we're 50% men and 50% women, or now that gender is less binary in our thinking, I might say that sensitivity is found equally across genders, even though we don't have specific research about different genders. Um, we just haven't noticed any difference around sex, at least. And so when you look at sensitive men in Western cultures or more immigrant cultures, 
you will have a hard time finding them because they're, you know, I think has Australia gone through this last couple decades where sensitive men, men are supposed to become sensitive or be more sensitive. Mm -hmm. They're not talking about highly sensitive men. So there is a little bit of an acceptance, but even if a, a man is more sensitive and expressing their sensitivity in a more open way, then they're seen as negative in some way or not man enough or masculine enough. So we might see highly sensitive men in, in such societies being more withdrawn, um, more secretive about their sensitivity. Maybe they might even get misdiagnosed as avoidant or autistic. And, and when they are not just because they they don't want to go out in society as much because it's more challenging to be a man. Yeah. So guess where that's not true? Thailand. And <clears throat> my son just spent the summer before last, he, he spent um, in monasteries in Thailand his uh, first year after high school when he was 18. And he said, if you think about it, mommy, when the, when the most popular men in the culture are monks, then it makes sense that the culture would value sensitivity. And um, so the research shows that um, sensitive men in Thailand are revered and um, that it's a great place to be a sensitive man. And, you know, all the culture, if, oh, the other place I was going to go with this is I'm always asking people, where's your shaman's hut? Um, if we think of more native peoples and tribes, um, though they still exist, they, many of them are not living the way they um, originally did live before their countries were colonized or their cultures were colonized. And um, in most of those more native, close to the earth societies, there was a shaman or a medicine person. There were, there were these spiritual leaders in the tribe who were revered and valued. And often they would live off on their own, off in the woods, or I would, I like to say a quarter mile away from the village across the creek. And food was brought to them and they were clothed by the community so that they could be restored. They could spend time in nature gathering herbs and thinking their deep thoughts and um, really aligning with the, with the natural world and the spiritual world. And then they were their best selves to be able to provide advice and counsel and healing to their families and their communities. And I, I have a little chill because you know, I, we all need to find our shaman's hut so that we can do that kind of nurturing and supporting and honoring of our sensitivity so that we can be in the world to make it a better place. Absolutely agree. Um, I know we're going to get asked this question. So I have to ask you, do you mind just detailing and you have briefly the, the five to thrive um, techniques or options or ways in which to thrive? Yes, absolutely. I would love to. So I, the first one is to be aware of the trait mm -hmm. and to believe it. No, you have it. Um, I already mentioned designing a life that's compatible. So um, I'll just encapsulate that one and find your shaman's hut. And um, another one is to be in community with other highly sensitive people. Now, this is nothing new. We know from resiliency research and from studying of different cultures and minority groups that when you are in some way in a minority, knowing others like you makes you healthier in terms of your mental and spiritual health and emotional health. So being in community with other people who are highly sensitive, going and finding them, you know, where do you find them? That's always a question that's asked. And um, I, what I always think of, and I have a little bit of writing about HSPs on my website about, you know, where I think I even asked, have this in my FAQs, where do you find highly sensitive people? You know, poetry readings, the symphony, the hiking club, um, the, the library, you know, places, I already mentioned universities, places where um, people are going deep, more deep into their conversations and their thinking is often where you will find them. Um, and, you know, you'll find me at the barn. So yeah. being in community with other highly sensitive people. And then there are two that are kind of hard work and the five to thrive. One is reframing the past or reframing your childhood. Now, very few people who are highly sensitive were raised with the perfect childhood. We're told throughout their childhood that all those emotions they had 
were wonderful. And the fact that they asked a million questions and questioned everything their parents said was wonderful. And that they couldn't really handle the big family gatherings um, or they would become overtired before all the other children. How lovely and wonderful. It's generally not not true. And um, I think in my Google talk, I tell my story about birthday parties and um, you know how I just hated birthday parties as a child. And so I felt like the weirdo. Now, fortunately, my mother is a highly sensitive introvert. And so she respected and honored that they weren't good places for me. And so I, and I think I mentioned, and I don't know if I mentioned in this interview, but I grew up in Oklahoma in a very rural area. And so I was in nature. I had a lot of barn chores to do. Um, I didn't have a lot of rules and um, I had my relationships with all the animals. You know, my chore was to go out every day on my pony and count all the cattle to make sure that none of the cows were, had disappeared to go have their calves. How wonderful. It was a wonderful childhood. And, you know, it's so perfect for sensitivity. And at the same time, my sensitive father, my sensitive extrovert father did really was worried about my sensitivity. You know, from his experience, he wanted to toughen me up so the world didn't eat me alive. Oh my know? gosh, we hear that all the time. It's time to toughen up. Oh yeah, absolutely. And, you know, be, be that person who can, uh, you know, who can go out and conquer the world and that's what will be successful. So I had plenty of mixed, you know, plenty of messages. I had a great life. And I also had the message that I needed to be um, uh, not as sensitive. And, you know, that was probably who I heard, you're too damn sensitive. So when I look back and I say, oh, I didn't like birthday parties because my brain's more reactive and popping balloons and screaming children and lots of sugar and all of that stuff was just overwhelming to me. I was taking it in at a much deeper level. And so I wasn't, I wasn't actually a strange or mentally ill child. I just had a more reactive brain. I noticed things and took them in more. So that's one big part of it. Um, reframing childhood or reframing your past, but you can look back even say for people who are just now discovering they're sensitive, look back on that job that didn't work for you, where it was just high pressure deadlines all the time. And, you know, there was a, a supervisor or a coworker who was, you know, screaming into their phone in the next cubicle and you just left work every day with a headache or whatever it is. It wasn't that you weren't resilient. It wasn't that you weren't good at your work. It's that it wasn't compatible with your trait. And hopefully by now you found a way to find that job that honors your trait and appreciates it. And, you know, the research on work. Do you mind that I'm digressing so much? I love it. I love it. I'll recap the five to thrive. I promise. I love this. One <laughs> succinct thing. The research on sensitive people at work is that our supervisors rate our, our job performance way higher than our peers who are not highly sensitive. And we have much lower job satisfaction than our peers who are not highly sensitive. So smart companies find a way to honor and work with their sensitive employees because they are the ones, they may need a little more time to come up with the response because they're thinking so deeply, but they have you know, a dozen solutions for every problem that the rest of the company hasn't thought of. So if we can in corporate world or very any kind of a restaurant, it doesn't matter, you know, that highly sensitive person is going to be the best weight person the best server, because they're going to be so tuned into all their tables and, and every, everything that the person at the mm -hmm. table wants. But if they, every time they go back to the kitchen, they're screaming and yelling and it's high pressure and um, they're being, you know, put down for, for being too slow, they're not going to be happy. And so they're going to quit that job. So finding ways to um, make our work life work for us is another kind of reframing the past. And, you know, looking back, I worked in um, the Department of Public Health and Community Mental Health, both big public clinics um, as counselors and therapists in my 20s. And, you know, it was such hard work for me. It was just, you know, so hard. And it would have easily made me not, not be a therapist if I had stayed in that environment. Um, you know, now I get to work at the barn. <laughs> yeah. So the fifth five to thrive item is healing past trauma. And this is the big one. And it's so important. And here's the reason that it's so important. We are more impacted by trauma. 
the way our brains work is we are more reactive and susceptible to both good things and bad things. And um, the scientific word for this is called differential susceptibility. All it means is our brains are differently susceptible to our environments. It's that simple. There's a ton of research um, by Michael Pluis and Jay Belsky and Tom Boyce, lots of um, scientists out in the university worlds. And um, they've proven, and they used, originally we thought that being highly sensitive was a vulnerability factor. That if you were highly sensitive, you were more vulnerable and that was all, the, all there was to it. And probably many of us grew up feeling pretty vulnerable mm -hmm. with our sensitivity. It turns out that it is not just a vulnerability factor. It's also a positive influence factor, a strength. So it's a differential factor. So what that means is in a stressful environment, with not great parenting or bosses or teachers or whatever, we are going to do way worse than the 80%. Really, we're gonna have potential mental illness, um, more injuries, uh, poor job satisfaction, but especially the children, worse respiratory illnesses. And you know what, what might the poor environment be? It could be marital conflict or poverty or um, violence or, um, uh, mental illness or substance abuse. It, it really, you can put any vulnerability factor, any negative stressful environment um, on that scale. And no matter what, if we have a lot of that, we're going to do poor, more poorly. However, if we have a good environment, we have not all those things going on. We have way fewer illnesses, way less mental illness, way less injury, way less stress than the 80%. I mean, the lines, the 80% line is kind of like this and our line is like this. So over here where there's high stress, I mean, low stress, we hardly have any problems. Over here where there's high stress, we have lots of problems. So that's why trauma impacts us more. So we could all just, and you know, I often say that growing up as a sensitive child is traumatic for many, many sensitive children. Just just being in your family, in your school, nobody had to do anything wrong for you to feel traumatized. Mm -hmm. And, but then there are also big traumas. And, you know, if you think about the world during the pandemic and, you know, so much dramatic news has been traumatizing to me. I don't know about you. I used to love to watch some news right. and I've had to take news fasts, you know, of weeks long to can just heal from the that feeling that it gave me. So healing past trauma. And I, I'll just say that I, I think it's really important to have therapy help you with healing past trauma. It's hard to do on your own and, um, and it can be very provocative. So I, I think, and the other thing, while we're on therapy, I would like to say for highly sensitive people, it's, it's important that you're a discriminating consumer. It's really important that you, you know, interview the therapist and talk to them about the books and learn about the trait yourself. Watch my talk at Google, buy the book by Elaine Aaron, who coined the term, the highly sensitive person. She even wrote a book for psychotherapists um, for, you know, you can be, if you're a therapist out there, please get that book or the DVD. It's not regular online yet. Still kind of <laughs> some HSPs are sort of slow in the tech world. Um, but um, become a, a certified therapist helping highly sensitive people. There aren't enough of us out there. Um, but if you go to hsperson.com, you can look up your area and see if there's a therapist who has studied high sensitivity. They're hard to find. So what you do, you talk to the person. And if they're like your parent and they think it's a bunch of poppycock, how's that for slang? Is that an Australian slang word? No, but I, I get it. <laughs> If, if, the, if you talk to a psychologist or a psychotherapist and they think it's a bunch of baloney, this high sensitivity thing, they're probably not the right therapist for you. So, um, cause a great therapist will want to learn about you and learn what you have learned about you. Um, so, and, and re respect your, who you are, your nature in the world, cause it's not changeable. Yeah. So here we go. Let me recap the five to thrive. Yes, please. Get your, get your pens ready. Um, <laughs> To understand and know the trait and believe you have it, one. Two, heal from past trauma. Three, reframe your childhood. Four, 
design a life that's compatible with your trait. And five, be in community with other highly sensitive people. Have friends, find them. Tell people you're sensitive and they'll be just like you, Louisa. You're like, you're describing me. Yeah. There's tons of people in your life like that. I'm sure you've attracted them. Yes, quite, most certainly. I was about to say quite possibly, but most certainly. That was just wonderful. Those five traits, the five tips are just fantastic. Um, <laughs> I'm just reminded I heard a quote the other day, life is so much safer when you turn off the television. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> I'd just like to quickly move on to you often talk about how highly sensitive people or children, teenagers are misdiagnosed with anxiety or depression. So, yeah, I'd love to talk about that. And adults too. And adults. Sorry, so, I left you us out, you out, anyone. <laughs> but I mean, I, I am sort of, I guess I'm, I'm on the crusade to help the children mm -hmm. because they're going to be us, Yes. right? If sensitive children are honored and they're not shamed, then they are going to be the powerhouses that really can improve our world. You know, they're going to be the ones who believe in global warming. And they're going to be the ones who find the answers. And so it's, you know, they're the humanitarians and the, you know, spiritual leaders. So I, it, I do, oh, they're so important. And, and, you know, I'm sure everyone who sees this interview knows a child that they can identify as highly sensitive. And one of the things those children need most is adult friends, mentors, people who see them and know them and value them for who they are. So you can be that person. So it's not so much about me misdiagnosed with anxiety and depression. In fact, if we come from stressful environments or live in stressful environments, we are actually more likely to have anxiety or depression than the 80%. But when we are designing a life and taking amazing care of ourselves, we are much less likely. Sometimes what happens, remember we were talking about overstimulation, the O and DOES yes. and over arousal. If we don't design a life and we just go out there and overdo all the time, overstimulation or overarousal can become such a habit that it can turn into anxiety. And we might get diagnosed with it. And I don't think there's anything wrong necessarily with having an anxiety diagnosis, but I do believe it's preventable for most highly sensitive people who have healed their past trauma. So it is, if we kind of spend our lives wound up, right? then we get on that, that hamster wheel and, or the treadmill that's just going faster and faster and faster. And it's too hard to get off. And sometimes I like to say my higher power wields a two by four, because I'm one of those really stubborn, highly sensitive people that just goes, goes, goes. I'm also high sensation seeking, which is another trait that can coexist with or without high sensitivity, but it can coexist with high sensitivity. And um, it means that I'm always doing the next thing. I'm, I'm always overdoing. And um, then one day something comes and, and it just knocks me off my feet and I have no choice but to rest. But it's much better not to be like me, <laughs> do as I say, not as I do, but to actually create a life where you're, you know, there's some modulation and rest. So, um, I think we can definitely end up with those diagnoses. However, this is something that I think is very interesting. Remember I said how we're, we're more emotionally responsive even for positive things than we are for negative mm -hmm. things. Like I, both those strong emotional rea reactivity really is what it is. You know, I can see a commercial on TV or um, see a child, you know, accomplishing something and have tears in my eyes. Or I can talk about racism and begin to weep. And a therapist who's not knowledgeable could say, she's depressed. She's so, you know, aff her affect is so labile and she's, you know, and so we have to be really careful with highly sensitive people to really think about, you know, maybe this feeling that they're having is actually appropriate for what's going on in the world or if what's going on in their family. You know, I, I practically had a meltdown over my son growing up and leaving home, you know, graduating high school, oh. going off to college, you know, it just broke my heart. And, you know, I guess I could have been diagnosed with depression and anxiety because it was really, but I was just having a lot of feelings. I was thinking about everything about it and just, um, you know, having strong emotions about it. Now, 
we talked about ADHD a little bit ago with children and adults, actually. And um, I have a video on YouTube, um, Do You Think You're ADD? A, which is attention deficit disorder. And a lot of highly sensitive people might think or be misdiagnosed with ADD or ADHD. Because when you're overstimulated, you have a hard time paying attention to things. I mean, I don't know how you do breakfast in the morning, but when I'm cooking breakfast for my family and I'm also on the phone and I'm also trying to put on my makeup to go to work and um, I'm burning the toast, you know, and I'm like yeah. ADD. <laughs> Definitely when I'm overwhelmed, it's hard to focus. The difference between those diagnoses, ADHD and ADD, and being highly sensitive and overwhelmed is that in a good environment, we can focus like nobody's business. It's easy to focus and to go deep. You know, I, I'm actually I'm not thinking about anything about what them our conversation right now, because we're having a deep conversation about something I'm passionate about. But if everybody comes home in my family and we start doing a bunch of things, then I'm going to lose my phone in the couch or whatever, you know, it's just, that is different than actually having that diagnosis. So I do think that many children and adults diagnosed with ADHD or ADD may be misdiagnosed and may actually be highly sensitive. So that is a, a big area of potential misdiagnosis. Um, I also think it's very important that if you do feel anxious more more of the time than not, or depressed more of the time or not of the time than not, that you seek medical help, because um, if you are stuck in a loop of one or the other of these depression or anxiety, you can get help, and you can actually step out of that loop. And sometimes it becomes such a trap that you can't do it on your own. So for people who are feeling so isolated and you know, just kind of unparalyzed by either depression or anxiety, it's really important to reach out for help. And there are many different ways to get help. Many, many different modalities of healing arts, um, alternative and more traditional. And I, I can't say what's right for you, I can just say that it's really worth it to get help. You know, I have acupuncture that helps me with my anxiety. And um, I love it. My acupuncturist can stick a, a needle right here. You know, this spot. Yeah. And I just chill out. Boom. <laughs> <laughs> I'm a big fan of acupuncture as well. Actually, I haven't been for a while. But um, Elaine, such remarkable insights. Every time you say something, I'm, I keep thinking, wow, that really, you know, that really clarifies things and it makes sense. Um, are there any questions that I haven't asked you that you, information you'd like to share with the Passion Harvest audience? Um, you know, I, this is my soapbox. I'm going to jump on it for a moment and say that if you are, and I, I suspect that most of your audience might be highly sensitive. Probably. Um, or, or married to one or something like that. If you are highly sensitive and this resonates with you, I, I ask that you really educate yourself about it. Um, really learn about the trait. Um, you can look me up. I do two webinars a month and I have these sensitivity circles um, where small groups of people come on and we talk about different topics, you know, sort of parenting while highly sensitive, working while highly sensitive, being in relationship while highly sensitive. So Educate yourself about it and learn about it so that you can teach others. And the soapbox message is come out. You know, Harvey Milk was the first openly gay elected official in the United States in the 1970s. And his message to everyone was to all gay people was come out. If everyone, if you, if everyone who was gay told someone they were gay, it wouldn't be surprising to anyone anymore. And I, you know, I think, Gay people are doing much better with that now. Highly sensitive people, not so good. So I ask you, highly sensitive people, to talk about your sensitivity in your communities and in your families. It's nothing to be ashamed of. It truly is a superpower. And show people how you use your sensitivity to be a good friend or a good family member and how you are so big-hearted and open-hearted and how much love you have to share at work, how many things that you've thought of, how many solutions you've come up with, be willing to talk about being sensitive so that the children and the adults in the world, the 20% 
almost 1.7 billion people in the world have this trait, have this more reactive brain. And so I hope that now that you know a little bit about it and you can talk about it, that you will read up on it, watch the documentary, Sensitive, The Untold Story, watch my Google Talk, and go out and teach the world about this amazing trait. Absolutely fabulous, Elaine Friend. So where's the best place for people to contact you? Um, I have two websites, and I think those are probably the best places. One is areyouhighlysensitive.com, and it, that's the, the home of my Are You Highly Sensitive live webinars. Um, it's a monthly membership, and um, it's very inexpensive, and there are scholarships for people who can't afford it. And um, so we do these two live webinars a month, and they're really fun. So I hope you'll come. And then my events are on my website, elainefriend.com. It's my um, therapy and consultation website. Uh, I would love, I am in the market to have a very strong YouTube following. I, I have a video on my YouTube channel called Elaine Friend Introvert YouTuber. So if you can come find me on YouTube too, I really would appreciate it and subscribe. <laughs> <laughs> and again all your links will be in the show notes as well so elaine friend thank you so much for all your in incredible insights and what a wonderful ambassador you are for highly sensitive people thank you so much you're so welcome i'm thank you for giving me the opportunity pleasure bye-bye bye, -bye. bye. If you like this episode, please do subscribe for weekly passionate inspirational interviews. 